Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Chris Greer. I'm with uh, City Capital Introductions. I run the team globally. It's part of the Global Prime Finance uh, Finance Group. Uh, when I was asked to do this panel, and it actually got put into print, um, a couple things I found were interesting came up. First of all, uh, people started calling me and considering me an expert in the area of tail risk hedging and uh, uh, volatility and, and uh, portfolio uh, management. Today I'm the moderator, so there's no risk of me proving or disproving that fact. So um, that, um, secondly, I received calls from my investors. I received calls from uh, hedge funds and consultants asking me about it. They're saying, we don't understand this strategy. We hear about it, we read about it, and we see it all the time and we want to get more information on it. Besides joining us today, some, some are here. Uh, I've received a lot of questions. We put together a very interesting panel of, of folks to, uh, to address it. My goal today is to try and help put together a conversation about what really is tail risk hedging, how do people implement it, and answer your questions you may have about it from the, uh, utilizing the panel we have here today. So we're gonna start off with questions to each of the panelists, get the discussion rolling. But then during the general session, as we start to talk, I am going to look around the audience. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, uh, we'll get a microphone to you and participate in the discussion. If you have questions or comments on what's being said, we'd love to have you, uh, love to have you involved. So first, I'm going to start with uh, Julie Kung, who's an uh, uh, investment specialist at Amundi covering volatility, convertible bonds, and long short equity. Um, Julie, the first question I have for you is, do you consider volatil volatility a hedge? Okay. Um, uh, at Amundi, we, we actually have a couple of volatility strategies where we're lo really looking at it as a, a source of alpha. So we're really seeing volatility um, as a, a unique and somewhat different um, source of absolute return. So um, we, we don't consider it as, as a, a pure tail risk strategy because um, we have some volatility funds that can go long volatility but also go short volatility um, depending on uh, the cyclicality of, uh, of, of volatility as we were talking about before. And then we're also having another range of products where we're really looking at uh, relative value opportunities in volatility. Uh, across and between asset classes in order to basically um, actively trade volatility as a, a, a source of alpha rather than as uh, something that would always be a, a tail risk hedge, which would imply that you would, would generally be, be long volatility if you're, you're trying to be a tail risk hedge at all times. Thanks. And that's going to be the, uh, towards the end, we want to get to that answer. I guess the, the topic today is, is it a, purely a hedge or, or can it be used as a, an alpha generating strategy? So I, I look forward to that being part of the conversation. Uh, Nikhil. Nikhil Mancoti is the partner and co-head of Asia Trading for Pine Rivers Asia Fund and co-head of their tail risk hedging fund. Um, the question to start off with for you today is, should investors look within their broad hedge fund holdings to hedge tail risk, or does it require a dedicated fund with specific expertise? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, investors should use both. Uh, clearly, as one builds a portfolio, you need different kinds of strategies, and you hope to have anti-correlated strategies along the way. Um, you know, we run a tail fund product. It's something that our internal funds invest in, and so we certainly believe in it. You know, the, the holy grail of investing is to find flat carry and positive carry, long convexity trades. That's what we do all day with our relative value funds. I'm sure everyone you meet here is always going to try and do. In reality, there are risks that are involved in those trades, and, and I think particularly in today's world with high correlation among different strategies, among all diff different asset classes, it, it, those trades can be difficult. For us, a tail fund as a separate investment makes a lot of sense. It can provide liquidity when people need, need liquidity. It can provide ways to put new capital to work in times of tail, stra of, times of tail events happening. And it's, it's simply a form of insurance. And, and so, yes, we believe it's important for people to have it. Um, you know, it's not a, that, that side of it's not an alpha strategy. So, so maybe back a little bit to your question earlier, volatility can be a hedge or an alpha strategy, but when it's used as an alpha strategy, you'll have liquidity risk, you'll have counterparty risk. Even in these positive carry convex trades, you'll have them. And 
you know, for us having a tail strategy which has very liquid products and most importantly will guarantee to protect you in a, ta in a you know, five standard deviation event or whatever we want to use to call a tail strategy, tail event is extremely important in the portfolio. Thanks. Um, Kirill Alinsky is joining us today. He's a founding partner and CIO over at Fusion Asset Management. And along those lines, one of the questions I probably got most in the last few weeks are, help me understand the difference between volatility, long volatility, and tail risk hedging. Is there a difference? Uh, yep, there is a difference. And uh, that comes back to what uh, Nikhil said about having separate uh, alpha generating fund which trading wall, both long and short, and having separately tail fund which has a pure negative carry but then generate tail. Basically, if you think about trading volatility, I, I disagree with what you said and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. I think the holy grail is not to have positive carry and uh, not to sell optionality in the middle, but actually have pure long wall product. So pure long optionality product where you can manage negative carry. I think really the main scare for people is to have this negative carry and that's why we go into long term <laughs> products like long term variant swaps or whatever long term options where carry is relatively small and then it creates uh, negative convexity in the portfolio management where if volatility comes down you need to cut rather than to load. So our philosophy was very, very different. We we have long pure long wall product for five, six years now. And we have long short volatility product where this long short volatility product is actually long product which we have separately plus short wall product. Yeah. And the thing that really the holy grail is to manage this negative carry, be absolutely open about this negative carry, manage this negative carry and make money in the longer run. Um, coming back to the question, trading volatility and trading tail is two different things. It's two different things for you because you can think about trading volatility or putting money in volatility manager is a long volatility play. And then you start timing the manager. So manager timing the market and you timing the manager. And then you sit in it for three, six, 12 months and then you get money out in July last year and after that we have 25%. Yeah. So don't try to time us. Yeah. You, you, you spend 12 months with the guy, you think he's a good guy, give him money and don't try to time us because probably it will create negative value. Uh, with tail, you're not supposed to time at all. Yeah? Because otherwise, you will never catch the tail. For us, it's a difference as well. So we, when we're trading volatility, if, if say, whatever volatility is at 40%, we find it very difficult to add. We still will be adding a little bit because we have to in long wall product. Yeah? But we find it difficult to add. So we'll be looking at a lot of opportunities, lighting up a book and so on. So effectively, we'll be taking money out <coughs> from the table. With tail, you never effectively almost never take money off the table because otherwise you will never see the tail. Yeah, if you if you really think in terms of I have very simple picture for me, what is volatility trading, what is tail trading. Think about VIX. VIX below twenty, VIX from twenty to thirty, what VIX from thirty to whatever. Yeah? If VIX be below twenty can be there, there for a long time, there are short term volatility spikes, that's how you basically make money in the short term. Then VIX spike from 20 to 30, quickly comes back, that's volatility spike, that's like a calls things which will make you money or us will make money. It's like call spread on wall. Yeah? It's quick, quickly coming back. That's volatility trading. If VIX goes above 30 and stays there usually for half a year, yeah? then it can go to 30, 60, 80, whatever. We, we, spoke, we, we heard a lot in, in the last panel. Yeah? You will never realize the tail, you will never receive the tail if you start taking money at 30, 35. So money management for, for, for investment manager is very different managing wall product or managing tail product. Great. Uh, thank you. Our, our, our final panelist today is Anthony Limbrick, principal and portfolio manager for 36 South and a member of their investment committee. Um, right before the panel, he asked me to ask one word question, beta. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. I'm very happy to be here. And I think it's uh, it's interesting that as a group of managers and as a group of investors, we haven't we don't understand what our beta is. I'd like to thank Dino for throwing that hand grenade into the crowd because 
this is a very, very important thing to work out before we actually look at what we're doing. Um, I have some uh, quite a strong opinion on what beta is in this product and this strategy. And I'd like to go back to Catherine Kaminsky's um, uh, comments this morning, which I thought were very good. And she talked about you know, trading volatility, uncertainty, what is uncertainty, or how is uncertainty, how does it manifest in what we trade? Well, manif man uncertainty is essentially uh, monetizes in, in the products we trade as a risk premium. So to take on uncertainty, we demand a risk premium. So let's think about, with options, how does that manifest in the, in the overall payoff? Well, when we buy an option, we pay away for the uncertainty. So therefore, those on the other side of the trade are taking on a risk premium, assuming the uncertainty, in return for what they believe to be um, a long-run uh, return stream. I'd like to go back out to um, just a very simple analogy. When we buy stocks and we buy an index, say for example the MSCI world, um, what are we doing then? That's our beta. For most people uh, who invest, investing in stocks and stock beta is buying something like the MSCI world. What is that index return actually showing you over time? It's showing you a combination of capital growth and dividends, which is a manifestation of the monetization of a risk premium. So therefore, what is the beta in volatility? Well, it is the monetization of risk premiums, which is the premium that we pay for an option. So to say that our beta is actually long volatility is not quite true. In fact, it is, our beta is the long run monetization of the risk premium that option sellers receive. For that reason, um, we, we talk about negative carry on long option strategies. Well, that's correct because if it's a risk premium, over time it should, for an exchange for risk, you should, ex should receive a positive return through the, through the cycle with um, shocks uh, over time as well. Um, so putting that in context, if you think about long volatility strategies, any long volatility strategy that has a positive expected return through the cycle is actually adding significant alpha against that beta. Let's go back to um, the expected return of something like a, a, a volatility strategy. So you would expect um, a positive return if you assume short, a short volatility profile through the investment cycle. Um, you accept small shocks, large shocks as part of that. A long volatility manager takes the other side of that. And doing so through most of the cycle assumes a negative return, but there occasionally has small profits, medium sized profits, and quite large profits in tail events. But investing around the long run mean of volatility means that uh, it's very difficult to uh, assume that you're going to have a steady positive return through the investment cycle. However, if you time your exposure both to volatility and also to the tails of the distribution, you can actually create a positive expected return, but that is not a beta. So very important from my perspective to understand that uh, when Dino talks about what is our beta, we need to understand it is the, monet it is the expression of the monetization of that risk premium. So anyone in this, out of these managers right now who is creating a positive expected return, <coughs> taking the other side of the distribution, is adding significant alpha. And I can expand on that later if you want. Can, can I yeah. Please. We, we can talk for an hour what is beta and how and so on. Yeah, there are so many answers. But really, if you invest in a fund, this fund, so you, you can have IBM shares, you can have Apple shares, and you can have Fusion shares. At the end of the day, it's a share. Yeah? So at the end of the day, you can think about any vol trading, anything, anything as a share. Yeah? Now, this share, with respect to 
S&P, why not S&P? Yeah, S&P or, or basket of with equity indices, think about it as, as another equity. So now this equity has volatility, has correlation characteristics, yeah? And when you go to your CAPA and look what's the expected return with that sort of correlation, with that sort of volatility, what's my expected return? And you will see immediately that if fund has negative correlation of 60%, the expected return on the fund yeah, in equilibrium pricing is minus, I don't know, 5%. That's your beta for us. Yeah. That's, that's how, because at the end of the day, beta is linear model, CAPM is linear model, that's exactly how beta calculated, that's, that's my benchmark. So now if I'm up above that, yeah, with my correlation, my volatility, I, I added value, that's my alpha. Yeah. Now, that's a simple answer to that. Now let's move a little bit further. So now I can be sort of linearly positive, but actually selling a lot of tail. And this tail you will never see in linear models. Yeah? Because it's a linear model. It only knows covariance and pretty much it. It doesn't know uh, skewness and it doesn't know kurtosis. Yeah? So now if you know the model, which is CAPM model, but takes and take out all the four characteristics, tell me, because I don't. But I'd like to see how you would benchmark me against my positive convexity and positive skewness. Because for skewness, yeah, I bring you value. Yeah, that costs money. So I added you value, I didn't charge you for that. In terms of kurtosis, I added you value, you know that. You know that in, in like August last year, I was 16% down. I never was 16% down. I was 5% down in my first months. So it's very clearly kurtosis is positive for me and skewness is positive for me. Now, that adds to this expected sort of return on my funds, where I add value. I'd just like to say, I think what we're talking about there is a strategy beta, an exotic beta, when in terms of our basic source beta and the strategy. It, again, if we go back to the example, I was going to talk about the um, hedge fund research index. The hedge fund research index, um, if you compare the returns of dedicated short bias, to that index, you'll find they tend to under, underperform over time. That's because they're taking the other side of the risk premium. And um, think of, again, coming back to my analogy of the, uh, the beta for the strategy being the monetization of the uncertainty risk premium. Therefore, any investor in this asset class um, who's making money relative to that risk premium from the short volatility side is doing well, but anyone who's actually taking the other side of that negative expected return and po creating a positive expected return through the investment cycle is doing something quite extraordinary. If you think about dedicated short bias against the hedge fund research index, for example, they have performed very, very poorly. But to have strategies that are, have positive expected returns through the investment cycle that are actually taking the other side of a risk premium is something quite incredible. And uh, this is one of the only strategies left because of the lack of crowding that it's possible with the right investment strategy to have a positive expected return taking the other side of the risk premium. And uh, from our perspective, um, we strongly believe that the basic structure of our strategy, which it looks at not just volatility, but also the cyclicality of, dis of directionality as well, that we can isolate points where there is a positive expected return in the, in the trades that we put on or across a range of asset classes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at the S&P 500, say it's just taking um, the long run mean of the S&P 500 vol. Um, if you were to buy vol on a five year option, just buying a put, um, the break even on a simple naive 10 delta put option strategy on the S&P 500 is a, a tail event of say negative 36% on equity beta every four years. However, if you buy vol at three standard deviations below its mean, you're now only expecting a tail event, a 36% uh, down move every 33 years. So it becomes very easy to create a positive expected return with a natural volatility of the market over that time. Not only do we do that, but we also isolate cheap directionality as well. So I think um, 
the point I'd like to make is that the, it is quite clear to me that beta is the, monetize, was the expression of the monetization of a risk premium, so therefore probably the beta of the strategy should be a combination of naive put uh, writing and call writing strategies. And all other all participants in the strategy should be evaluated against that beta. For that reason, those managers here are create, creating a positive expected return against that risk premium, taking the other side, are actually doing quite an incredible job. Does anyone else have comments on that? This is where I'm uh, going to start to say the audience needs to participate as well. We have a hand up in the back. I don't know if we have microphones for people in the back. Um, Would you mind taking the microphone just before? Can I just ask a question about your assumption that, and you said it's not crowded out space. If I look at the insurance industry and I buy from professional insurance people, it says a thousand people buying house insurance, I will lose money. The insurers have priced it correctly with a premium in their favor to make money. Yep. Why should this audience and my clients assume that Citigroup, JP Morgan, all these very supposedly smart people have not priced their premium in a reasonable cartel such that you can, the, the entirety of the volatility trading hedge funds must therefore lose money. It doesn't mean that your funds don't make money, but why wouldn't the group of hedge funds all lose money? So you're saying that uh, the pricing of volatility where it is right now is over essentially the, over, the rigged. Cycle, over the cycle, why wouldn't they be better at it? The same way insurance companies are better at it because they've got captive audiences to price it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I mean, from the point, this strategy is, is crowded to a certain extent in terms of the equity left tail. So there's a huge amount of interest in protecting portfolios against the equity left tail. So that's definitely crowded. But of course, that's coming from the other side of the risk premium. So that is, th these people are looking to protect against an expansion of that risk premium. So that is clearly quite crowded. But of course, that creates another opportunity the other side of that, which is to receive the risk premium because it's rich. Um, that being said, though, if you look at risk premium elsewhere across volatility, so not just in equities, across other asset classes, there are opportunities to actually buy volatility below long run means and to create a positive expected return out of individual trades. So um, in terms of your discussion of uh, is the market correctly priced, um, is hardly ever correctly priced, and it oscillates around between being wildly underpriced and wildly overpriced. And occasionally it might hit that fair price. Um, right now, it's wildly overpriced in terms of the equity left tail. Well, not wildly, but pretty heavily overly priced in, in terms of the equity left tail. But that creates an opportunity in itself. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying you're wrong in your answer. Yeah. I'm just saying you're trying to persuade investors to buy products. I'm just saying you buy products. And they're saying insurance companies Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I uh, take a stab at answering that question? So, <laughs> okay. I think, I think for, to, for, could we first get a microphone for you so the others can hear on the other side of the room? And if you could introduce yourself since you're going to join our... Yeah, hi, Jerry Hart here. <laughs> I think, to me, it's the answer to that question lies in the fact that the whole nature of volatility is counterintuitive. Everybody sells at the wrong time and buys at the wrong at buys at the wrong time. Even the J.P. Morgans of the world. So really, uh, why you think you're getting good value is that at like in 2007, <coughs> when volatility was at multi-decade lows, everybody was selling. And if you can find people that cross their wires and help you institute a program to do the right thing at the right time, we add value to your life. That's it. Can I answer your question? How I see, I think the answer is. I've been working for JP Morgan for a while. And actually, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not to say that I'm a smart guy or like, you know, it's not about that. It's about different players do different things. Uh, I think there is a, I mean, we talk about volatility and we say volatility so many times already and we probably will say more of the same word. But what is that? What is this volatility? We're trading volatility, what is it? 
Like, so we're trading options. Options, you pay one dollar and whatever, break even is that. What is volatility? Uh, depending, in the, the simple answer is, yeah, okay, there are weak futures, and in weak futures you can trade, and you don't need to know anything else. Then there are smart people in JP Morgan who will look at forward curve and vari variant swaps and will mark them to weak futures, and people will, will wash out the difference up to convexity adjustment. But really, when it goes back to variant swaps on S&P, and what's the right volatility on S&P? There is a market. There are options exist because there is a demand for options. So market makers, they cover this demand. They deal with their risk in a particular way. Why Black Scholes is important? Uh, somebody asked the question. So is it Black Scholes or not Black Scholes? Black Scholes was important because it was very clear to market makers and banks how to risk manage the book. Banks risk manage books in a different way from us risk managing the books. We can look at the same price of option and it will be no value for them and a lot of value for us and our way around. We risk manage in a different way from banks. Banks have benefit of exactly what you said, insurance companies. They have big portfolios. They have a lot of exotics. They cannot do any smart, really, things because in, in complicated modeling and so on, just because the Monte Carlo will not deal with it. And Basel III will not deal with Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo and Monte Carlo. So really, models, we cannot price in certain things and risk manage in certain things and, and so on. We can. We have like 20, 30 positions. Yeah, we, we can not delta H for a while or delta H according to a particular strategy, which will make my long volatility strategy effectively flat volatility strategy, depending how I manage my delta. Before you tell me how to manage my delta, there is no <coughs> point to talk about volatility. Yeah? So really the issue is, are we adding value in terms of taking the market price? Nobody knows what the fair value is. There is no fair value. We're all different. We risk manage it differently. We have all different fair value. So now, if I take this fair value, which I see, can I extract positive return from that or not? That's my skill. And that's their skill when they have 50 people on the trading floor, salespeople cover, calling corporate client, and corporate client buy very expensively uh, <laughs> options, which we don't delta hedge. And then they push it to me and pay me for recycling the risk. So basically, the answer is a segregated market, and people see value differently, and we extract to, to some extent this, this value from the segregation, sharing with, with the bank as well. Do, can we get, do we have someone carrying the microphone around here? We have a question up front, and then one over on the side. Thank you. Uh, the subject of this panel is, uh, is volatility an edge? Or an alpha strategy, but I want just to reformulate the question: and can volatility be an edge and an alpha strategy? And uh, for tail edge strategy, to be an alpha, to have an alpha strategy, is meaning that you need to short some volatility. So my question is: if you short some volatility, what is the risk for a tail edge to have some short in the portfolio? Should we? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sure. pass it to down to Julie at the end. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I guess since I mentioned that our funds do also go short volatility um, because we're not considering them as a tail risk. Um, so obviously there are some risks to, to going short volatility and you do need to calibrate those risks accordingly. Um, the funds that we're actually managing, um, we, we don't consider them to be hedge funds because we're actually managing them in a use its format with uh, daily liquidity so that um, all of the, the, the risk management needs to be in accordance with uh, use its regulations. So that means that the short volatility needs to be calibrated so that the, uh, when there is a tail risk um, uh, of volatility spiking, uh, we can effectively manage the drawdowns during that period. Because of course, we also don't have a crystal ball and we can't predict how high volatility will spike. So the, the fact is if, if you're a long and a short volatility and you're basing yourself off of the cyclicality of volatility, you're going to have to go short at some period. Otherwise, you're never going to turn short. So the idea is to really to be able to have a 
Um, partly quantitative, but also what's very important, we think, is to have a significant amount of discretionary leeway because every cycle in volatility is, 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 extremely, is extremely different. So I think, you know, in terms of the risks, it's really being able to have the right um, risk parameters in order to be able to uh, mitigate some of the, the tail risk when going short. Because going short volatility can be quite profitable, but I think it's very important that uh, we have to manage those risks. And also I think another topic that we wanted to discuss, uh, which is in the questions, is um, the, the maturity of the options that we're trading. So, um, you know, we're actually trading a medium term maturity, so options between 9 and 15 months. So our investment process is sort of calibrated in order to have, um, you know, somewhat of a floor and a ceiling for one year implied volatility, which has a very different behavior from the VIX. So the, in the earlier panel, we heard that the VIX, you know, generally um, ceilings at 45, but then during the Lehman crisis, it went all the way up to 80. Um, this kind of a behavior is similar with one-year implied volatility, but during the Lehman crisis, one-year implied volatility pretty much ceilinged at 45. Because if you think about one-year implied volatility as the market's expectations for volatility movements on a daily basis over the next 250 trading days, as opposed to the next 20 trading days for something like the VIX, that means that the market's expectations for something like the one-year implied volatility can more really have a ceiling because you're not going to expect the equity markets to move up or down by 5% every single day for the next 250 trading days, which is what an 80% volatility implies. So I think that has also needs to be calibrated in terms of, you know, what types of maturities are you trading and uh, what kind of instruments you're using in order to trade volatility to manage those tail risks when you're short. Maybe I could just take a different tack to, to your question. I think one of the really important things for investors to think about is tail hedging and anti-correlated strategies to their beta or to their other hedge funds and whatever that may be. And you can't confuse the two. Back to your question, a tail fund cannot be short vol ever. It's not a tail fund otherwise. It just, you know, um, you know, we've talked a lot about long volatility, and we heard in the last panel about TVIX and VXX and all the rest of it. You know, our tail fund also, if you give us $100 and you keep it with us for 20 years, it's all going to be gone eventually. It is like insurance. No, no, uh, don't save it. Uh, yeah. No, it is. It is. Uh, look, you know, we can have an argument. These guys can have an argument and say, these guys, they buy S&P puts. They're, you know, they're so rich. The, you know, these tail funds, they make everything expensive. From the other side, you know, in September of 2011, every fund was making money, but were we able to give people their cash back immediately? You know, we have quick liquidity. People wanted money to go and buy other things. Again, we think of it more for our internal strategies as we invest in some of these tails. We put a lot of value on that, on that liquidity. Now, look, there are ways people can be long volatility and still have positive expected return. Obviously, the panel wouldn't be here, but how's that going to happen? That's going to happen. People can time the market well. People are smart, they can get good executions, and they can find different type of relative value trades. So they're, you know, they're long volatility with the tails, but they're covering some of that carry along the way. But I don't think anyone would disagree if we sit here and buy 90% S&P puts every week for, you know, forever, it's going to lose. Uh, so there has to be other advantages for a tail fund. I mean, we've, we've met with a lot of, you know, pensions and longer term money people who don't have people to answer to. I don't think tail funds make sense for those people. Um, they should ride it out. They should add to their investments when, these, when, when a tail event occurs. They have that, that buying power for a hedge fund that has liquidity to meet, for a fund of fund that has liquidity to meet. It's very different. Uh, you know, the other thing I'd say about it is simply when you're flat, when everyone else is down a lot, it empowers you to put more money to work. That, that, that's the nature of it. That's the reason for tail hedges. Negatively correlated strategies are something else, and I think those can go long and short vol. You know, we can we can look at things like take for example variant swaps versus vol swaps. That pre-08, it's gotten more expensive now, but that was a very popular trade for people to be doing. Hey, I'm long this co convexity. You know, in September 08, when the variant swap markets went 10 vols wide and the vol swaps went 20 vols wide, you had to go to your investors and say look, this trade is working, we're realizing really well, every day of realize is really good, but I can't give you your money yet, we've got to wait for things to settle down. That doesn't mean it wasn't a long volatility trade, and over the, 
if it's a three month or six month trade, you realize your money over six months, you make a lot of money, it's a, it's a good trade, but you don't have that liquidity today. And that's something that I think happens within a tail fund or should, should be happening if you run a tail fund. Can I just ask, answer your question directly? So is it a hedge or is it an alpha strategy or can it be both? Um, we do believe it can be both. And uh, critical to this is if, if you're looking at one particular asset class, one instrument, uh, it's very difficult to justify uh, that's a single strategy as having a positive expected return, so therefore being an alpha type strategy. But however, if you move between asset classes um, across the commodities, interest rates, currencies, and deliberately choose sub-sectors, sub-instruments of these sectors, exploit the negative correlation at most times between the different components of these asset classes, you can find opportunities where you are picking up vol below its long run mean, you're picking up directionality cheap within a distribution. And you can put that together as a portfolio which gives you a structural exposure to volatility, but it's picking up value at different points through the asset class spectrum. The key point I'd like to make is that when you want that hedge, which is when volatility goes through the roof, correlation tends to one. It doesn't really matter which asset class you're in, they'll all start firing. Even your long equity calls will start contributing in a, neg in a relative value sense to the overall payoff. So we do believe, and, and, and it comes back to buying volatility below its long run mean, hopefully towards the bottom, you know, to, down two standard deviations, three standard deviations, but also buying directionality cheap. And uh, finding themes with uh, what we like to describe as power laws, where you have compounding on compounding, convexity on convexity, and put that against the underlying payoff of options. And in that sense, you get structural exposure, a structural hedge, and alpha on top of that. I'm now hearing that tail risk hedging is an alpha strategy. Most of us feel that. Um, where do you put it in your portfolio? How, if, if I'm out here saying, all right, I want to use this, am I thinking of it now as an alpha component of my strategy and putting it in as part of an allocation? Or am I keeping it as a hedge? I mean, who, who said that hedge should not be alpha strategy? But your question implies that hedge, where you lose well, money. Well, <laughs> because we, up till now, again, you know, coming, coming and being the, uh, the newfound expert on tail risk hedging, because I'm the moderator of this panel. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have been told it's a negative carry uh, vehicle. Yeah, that's right. I, I, that's what I, and, and every question I got, I'm bringing these from the States, so maybe it's just a U.S. thing. The, every question I got was, it's negative carry, and it, it seems to be very expensive. How do I put it, how do I think about it in my portfolio? I'm actually sitting here kind of going, wow, I've just found out that these things are very valuable to my portfolio. Where do I put them? What do you know, is it an equity component of my equity? Is it part of my alternatives portfolio? Where do I put it? Because all of a sudden now it's an alpha strategy that, that and I'm still kind of at a loss at because I don't know how you do it. So I, I, I'd love to, to go down that route a little bit. Well, I think um, one of the intriguing things about the strategy is that because of the lack of crowding, because it is still relatively new, in terms of, I said, the equity lift tail is expensive, but aside from that, it is pretty uncrowded. There's not that many players. For that reason, you do have the ability to provide hedging benefits to your portfolio, true diversifiers, while receiving a positive expected return. Now as the strategy gets more populated, a larger number of players, it will become potentially more difficult. But those who are, have been around for a while will probably have first mover advantage at least for some time. Um, so going back to the risk premium idea, um, I think it's valid to say that to have a passive uh, hedging strategy buying simple S&P 500 puts has a negative expected return. And so that's pretty clear. Um, so you, in order to minimize the, uh, the cost of that hedge, you need to add alpha. The way to do that is by having an intelligent approach in terms, to, in terms of finding value and, and volatility and in terms of the overall directionality of the instruments you're using as well. Does anyone else have to I, I think, you know, um, the way that I would answer that question in terms of how it fits into a portfolio, um, if you're considering volatility as an alpha strategy, it should fit into your portfolio in alternatives. 
um, or under absolute return. And uh, as I was mentioning uh, earlier on when the, when the panel opened, you know, we really see volatility as a, a good diversifier because, you know, even if you do have volatility arbitrage or long and short volatility, what you'll generally notice is, you know, tail risk strategies will have a negative correlation to uh, equities and most, you know, traditional asset classes. Whereas uh, some of these alpha strategies that are using volatility as a alternative source of alpha will generally have maybe not negative correlation, but nevertheless extremely low correlation to equities over the long term. So if you're playing off of the cyclicality of volatility by being sometimes long when it makes sense, when it's, you know, as uh, was said in the panel, below its long term average, and then being short volatility, for example, when it's extremely high and, you know, significantly above the long-term average, then that means over the long term, um, you can have a vehicle which is, you know, has close to a zero correlation to the, the equity markets. Um, so, you know, that's the reason why, because we don't see volatility as a tail risk hedge, uh, we tend to fit volatility into the portfolio, um, you know, our, our products, that is, as, as absolute return or as an alternative strategy. And if you look at volatility versus other alternative strategies like CTAs, global macro, long short equity, you can also find that these kind of strategies are very decorrelated to slightly negatively correlated even with uh, alternative strategies. But these, these less correlated strategies become extremely correlated at the time than you probably want them to be less correlated. So, you know, back to it then, is it really a hedge? So I'd like to take a second just and, and then let's ask some questions again from the audience. Um, what is a tail risk? I mean, what is the event? What, what, what event are we talking about? When people think about this, are they thinking of a 10% down, 20%? I know it's all to their own, you know, requirements. Generally, what do we think about? And do we think like, I mean, you have central banks that are stepping in being rather activists, which, you know, do you hedge to 40% knowing that a central bank might come in with QE 34 or, I mean. Well, I mean, very simply, you know, in simple terms, a tail event is something that's beyond three mitigation. So we're dealing with the something that's uh, very rare. Um, although, you know, we're talking about uh, uncertainty earlier on in the, uh, in the session. Uh, risk is something that you can anticipate going wrong, but you don't know the timing, essentially. Uh, whereas uncertainty is you don't know the timing and you don't know the magnitude as well. Um, so really, uh, there's two types of risks we're hed hedging against here. And we would call, you know, there's uh, the term black swans. Most market risks we're talking about probably fit into what we call gray swans. So they're, they're not, they're something that we can sort of anticipate, but we don't really know the timing and sort of we have a rough idea of the magnitude. Um, but it's our simple benchmark for a tail event in terms of uh, most asset classes, it was down 36% using equities as a benchmark there. So, yeah. You, you know, very simply, I think a tail event is, is something unexpected. You know, I agree with a lot of Anthony's points there that, that you, know, is, uh, you know, is a problem in the European peripheral in the next five years, a tail event? No. It's something everybody's talking about. It's something everybody, you know, is is a problem during LTRO a tail event? Likely, if we look at where front end yields or we look at where front end volatility can trade. Uh, so really to, to us, I mean, we would take, take a little further step back. I mean, it's a, a very fair definition, but really anything is a tail event that is unexpected. I, I mean, I think, you know, back to Julia's point that, that we worry about a little bit is timing volatility can be tough. Uh, and if you're not careful when you're timing volatility, then you're a macro fund. Nothing wrong with being a macro fund, but are you better off just doing that in futures rates, extremely liquid products where you can get in and out of them? And, and, and so for us, you know, like if I could tell you the next tail event, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be in my gold house, you know, uh, living a good life. But that's not something that, that, that any of us are able to do. Um, the other thing I think is really important as we think about tail events is understanding what your portfolio is. You know, in 2009, we lost tens of millions of dollars being long volatility. It was absurdly expensive by any measure that one might have looked at. We didn't care. You know, we owned investment grade bonds in our portfolio that were trading at 70 cents on the dollar that needed to accrete in the next 12 months. You know, the only way the only way our hedge fund wasn't going to recover out of 2008 was, you know, another massive tail event which made 50 vol look cheap. Look cheap. So that's the other thing we've got to think about with tails is is what does our portfolio look like? You know, for for some people here, you should be buying upside calls because inflation is your tail event, depending on what your portfolio looks like. Buy long dated, you know, buy long dated S and P. That can be useful. Can I maybe add as well from a totally different perspective? 
you can call me trading monkey, but basically I, I think <laughs> in terms of how we build trade construction. Yeah, so trade construction. If you long risk and if you have uh, one downside to one upside, it's not a bad trade. It's like typical equity type trade. Credit would be considerably less interesting. So therefore, if you look at uh, sharp ratios of different hedge fund styles, obviously people who employ less leverage and that would be distressed would be the best ever hedge funds. So long risk, if you have, say, two upside to one upside, it's a great trade, okay? Long volatility, long volatility, sort of call spread type on volatility. Uh, you think about chi-square distribution, two thirds of the time it's below average, one third above the average. So therefore, if you have trades where you have two upside to one downside, that's not an interesting trade, that's basically your average. So you need to have three to one, yeah? And when you think about money management, you probably cut, some of it, so three to one is your typical volatility trade. Tail trades for us is one to five, one to ten. Yeah? And it's not about volat probability adjusted or whatever, because there is no probability. Nobody knows anything. Yeah, market doesn't know anything. Market doesn't know how to price. It doesn't matter. So the trade should be one to ten, and that's a tail trade. So now with the situation where this trail, tail trade realized, and then you, you take a reasonable, you're a reasonable person, you've been around for 20 years, and so on, so If you think it's reasonable to expect this thing to deliver one to seven, yeah, that's a tail event for us. So then, when we think about trading separately wall and trading separately tail, we effectively think in terms of collection of <coughs> trades with that sort of upside down side on trades. Yeah, I would agree as well. I mean, we have a benchmark of five to ten times payoffs relative <coughs> to every dollar we spend. And uh, if it doesn't make its way into the so if it doesn't justify itself on those criteria, it doesn't make its way into the portfolio. What I would say though is by being pan-asset class, so going across asset classes, going sub-asset classes, finding individual proxies such as individual stocks as a proxy for an overall sector idea, um, you can find these five to ten times payoffs on a re regular basis. The only time really we found that we couldn't find these proxies was when volatility was expensive across all asset classes. And that, of course, was a very bad time to be buying Tails Hedges, which was in early 2009. So in that sense, uh, you know, from that perspective, you'd want to probably be in cash, which is what we were doing at that time. But uh, very slowly, the opportunities start appearing. And in fact, uh, we provided to our investors through 2009 a structural exposure to volatility when you wanted it, which was when volatility was just below the extent of the range. Um, but we did that by only losing 1.8% or I think it was 1.9% for the year. And what, how we were able to do that was by being pan-asset class, so finding cheap proxies that gave the five to 10 times payoff. There's one other tool that we have, which we think is appropriate, we're very careful to use this because we believe being short volatility, especially when our mandate is to be a structural exposure to long volatility, but we can actually use bounded downside short volatility exposures such as short put spreads. And we did that in early 2009 by selling equity index put spreads, individual equity put spreads. But our mandate is to provide a structural exposure to volatility. So of course, we had to find cheap proxies against that. And because we're pan-asset class and because we can use any part of the term structure, we managed to find very, very cheap, very long data volatility in the euro, around 9%. These are 10-year euro strangles. I'm going to uh, jump in. We have 10 minutes, and I want to get back out to the audience because you've heard a lot of comments. I want, you know, we don't go into lunch without some controversy, so someone asked the tough question. Come on, let's, let's do it. We have one right here. Wait for the microphone. Just, it's all technical here. Here we go. Yeah, I have a simple question, but it would be nice to have uh, an answer from each of the panelists. What caused the August 2011 stock market sell-off? Okay. That's um, <laughs> I'll try, I'll try to start with that one. Um, so, so last uh, summer sell-off, I would um, I'd say it's, it's quite a curious sell-off because in the month of July, um, uh, we we must not forget that it wasn't really the the euro debt crisis. It was uh, Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. wrangling over how to raise the U.S. debt ceiling um, and. Uh, uh, then there was a uh, downgrade by S&P uh, of the U.S. debt situation, which was also not unexpected because it was already announced uh, that if they didn't lower the U.S. debt ceiling uh, by a certain amount that there would certainly be a downgrade. 
Um, and then uh, it really very quickly shifted into the uh, European debt situation, which I would argue again was not completely unexpected because that has been known by the market since April of 2010. So I think that um, a, a large part of what caused the, the, the fall in the equity market, the dramatic fall in the equity markets, was simply a um, conglomeration of many different hot pressure points, which caused a, a dramatic change in market sentiment. So it, it's, it's not so much that you know, there was a bank that collapsed or you know, Greece defaulted. There was not one specific event like we saw in 2008, but it was a, a number of hot pressure points which the market chose to ignore during the first half of 2011, which all came together, which caused market participants to decide that it no longer made sense. And then market sentiment changed on a dime and, and volatility shot up. So it was a change from, 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 from greed to fear caused by a, a very, very rapid change in, in market sentiment, which I would argue is not, was not specifically driven by something that was completely unknown to the market uh, during the last week of, of July. I go. Um, and we have like we, five minutes. Yeah, so. we don't really care. I mean, that, 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 that's, that, that's the really short answer. It's no, um, you know, we could sit and talk for hours about hedge funds were throwing in the towel. They had bad returns. I mean, you know, we're just, we're quantitative guys and we're not macro guys. And I, I think one of the biggest mistakes you see out there is guys who are quantitative background trying to explain macro events. It's just, do you have the right trades on? Can you make money out of them? Do you have your tail hedges if you need them? That's what we think about. So I'll probably just pass on the question a little bit. Girl? Yeah, me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> really, you, you either analyst and you're looking forward to you historian and you're looking back and historians will usually win in the long run um, <laughs> <laughs> but basically people like people start selling when they tired of buying and uh, and after that people will find or during this period people will find all excuses why we're doing exactly what we're doing but realistically if we look at say what neuroeconomics telling us, people make decisions by their subconscious and actually after that try to justify it by, by doing processes in cortex. Reality is people live and die in very short term. Yeah? If you look at banks, banks die within two weeks. It's a liquidity thing. Yeah? So we can talk about, I never understood how macro guys trade and I have a lot of respect and I don't understand how we do it. Because really everything changed, perception changed within two weeks. Two weeks, one month. Fund of funds die within two, like two months, one month. Yeah, funds die within two weeks. I'm going to, uh, unless you have a quick. Oh, it's just. Uh, I think it's interesting you call that a crisis because global equities were down 20% from peak to valley, and in the conventional sense, that is not a tail event. And I think that raises quite a big issue going forward. Is that um, there is a confusion of tail risk protection with bear market protection or correction protection. And I think that uh, the danger for the strategy going forward is that uh, the, if the performance of these strategies will be judged against how well they do in corrections when in fact they should only really be judged against a three standard deviation event or more, which is 36% down in global equities, roughly. So um, I think... Um, yeah, I, I have one. I have one. No, I, I don't we think it's relevant. We have yeah. one last question, and then I have, I, I, we have one last question, and I'm going to have to. I, I'm sorry, I have a gentleman over here. Just to and then, but no one leave. Well, I have a huge announcement to make right after this, so please <laughs> don't leave. <coughs> I'm going to make an assumption: 100 million portfolio. This portfolio will make uh, one million every month. Yeah, can you speak in the microphone? Please? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. 100 million portfolio makes money every month. And, and, unless the VIX goes to over 25, let's say over 30. In this case, the VIX, uh, the portfolio will lose 10 million. How do I hedge against that? Great question to end on. Did everyone hear the question? No. No. So no. Uh, the no, VIX goes over 30, uh, the portfolio will lose over 10 million, 10 percent, let's say. Now, I don't buy the VIX every month or, you know, rolling call options. Sh buy a short on the. Uh, that's a short point on the S&P. Everyone gets what do one I do? minute to answer that, not even. Yeah. Less than 30 seconds. 30 seconds, yeah, 30 seconds. We have advisory. You come, you ask us this question, we sit with you and we talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> this answer brought to you by... I mean, you've complicated, you've all complicated what a simple, you know, 
<laughs> volatility is. I'm just asking a simple question. <laughs> so you're looking for negative correlation. So what we do is find what's driving your portfolio's negative performance and line up proxies that would work effectively against the problem parts of your portfolio. And then we use the natural convexity of options to provide a very efficient solution to that problem by not paying away too much in the interim. And then when the event does happen, you get typically five to, say, seven times what you've actually spent against it. Nico? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, it, uh, you know, we have to understand why VIX go into 25 does that to, port to your portfolio. I mean, from what you've just said, we would just buy VIX calls. I mean, if it was simple, I appreciate it's not going to be that simple. We've got to look at why long volatility hurts your portfolio and find the cheapest long volatility. I, I don't know when the VIX will go over 30. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I hold on to it for two years buying VIX options and, you know. Again, I mean, if, if you're making a million a month, but the VIX is too expensive to, to make that trade worthwhile, I'd argue it's not a great trade. Uh, you know, that million a month is, is, is a poor trade. You better go find better, better managers. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea what Julie's going to say, but go ahead, Julie. Uh, well, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, we're, we're not, again, we're not providing tail risk. But if you wanted to hedge something like the, the, the VIX uh, going, where we're also not trading the VIX, from 20 to 30, or one year implied volatility going from 20 to 30, for example, um, you know, we, we actually choose to use listed options only, plain vanilla listed options, um, you know, just because of the lack of the counterparty risk and also because of the liquidity of being able to trade with all players in the markets instead of just the interbank market. So that's one of the reasons why we choose to use uh, options instead of some of the uh, other instruments. Um, which, which have been mentioned, like variant swaps or you know, VIX futures uh, instruments. Um, and uh, in terms of you know, what do you do when, when you don't really know when uh, the VIX will go from 20 to 30 and you're having this <laughs> negative cost of carry, I, I would argue that um, uh, a portfolio needs to be actively managed so that any short-term fluctuations in volatility, surely you know, the VIX is not going to uh, basically trend from 20 to 30. Uh, it may also trend back to 20, but any short-term fluctuations while the VIX is trending from 20 to 30 are also opportunities that can be traded and also opportunities that can be used in order to mitigate um, the slightly negative uh, carry that you have uh, while being long volatility. Well, I want to, uh, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank the audience. There's some great questions. I'll